welcome everybody to this uh, session of our uh, webinar series, the Qualitative Methods Masterclass Webinar Series. I am Ricardo Contreras uh, with Atlas TI, and I'm here with uh, Mona Patterson uh, uh, from IIQM, uh, International Institute for Qualitative Methodology. Uh, today we have as presenters Dr. Melanie Bergs and Jane Mills, who will be presenting a philosophical positioning in grounded theory, striking the balance. Um, uh, a few things about go to webinar. Uh, your microphones will remain muted um, uh, until the very end. If you need to ask any questions to the presenters, please use the questions section in the control panel. Uh, and in fact, you can practice now by writing hello, and I will be able to read that. Um, the presenters will be speaking for about uh, 30, 35 minutes. And after that, we will open up for questions and answers. So I will, uh, I will, um, I will read those questions that you, that you wrote, and I will give the microphone to those who desire to speak. Otherwise, I will read those questions out loud, okay? Uh, so now I would like to offer the microphone to Mona Patterson from IIQM, who is going to introduce uh, today's presenters. Go ahead, Mona. Yes, Mona, go ahead. It's open now. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks, Ricardo. I hope everybody can hear me now. Great. Excellent. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'm here um, because Yvette is in a conference in Toronto. Um, so I'm very happy to be on the call and to introduce our um, two speakers today, Melanie and Jane. So Professor Melanie Burks um, is employed as a professor of nursing at James Cook University in Australia, a role that serves her passions for education, research, and nursing. Her primary focus is on the promotion of scholarship in teaching and learning uh, through mentorship and fostering a college culture of research. She has extensive experience in international education, having taught in Hong Kong, Singapore, Papua New Guinea, and Malaysia. Her research interests are in the areas of accessibility, innovation, relevance, and quality in health professional education to ensure preparation of graduates who are industry ready and able to make a contribution to their chosen profession. Her commitment to research is reflected in her publication history, which includes numerous journal, journal articles and book chapters. Most recently, she co-authored a second edition of the highly successful Grounded Theory, a practical guide with Dr. Jane Mills. And Jane is a professor of nursing, director of the Center of Nursing and Midwifery Research, and deputy, de deputy Dean of the Graduate Research School, also at James Cook University in Australia. In this role, Jane works closely with students and academic staff to build research and research education with the intent of creating a brighter future for life in the tropics worldwide through graduates and discoveries that make a difference. Jane's research is in the area of primary health care, health workforce development, health system strengthening, and teaching and learning using both grounded theory and mixed methods. Jane has published extensively in the area of qualitative methodology with her work on grounded theory particularly well received. She has been writing with Melanie Burks for nearly 10 years and together they have produced a number of important peer-reviewed articles and books that have guided students in their, work, in their own work. So welcome to Melanie and Jane. Thank you very much, uh, Mona. I will now give the uh, the screen uh, to Melanie. So go ahead, Melanie, and now it's it's all on you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Ricardo, and thank you, Mona, and good morning to everyone from sunny North Queensland. And uh, Jane and I are delighted to be here today, uh, although it's, a, it's 7 a.m. here, um, and we're both very, very pleased that we don't have webcams on because I'm not sure we're looking our absolute best this morning. Um, but we're very pleased, as I say, to be here to talk to you about one of our passions, which is grounded theory research, and in particular, the philosophical positioning of a researcher in grounded theory research. The reason that we've called this presentation Striking the Balance is because in grounded theory, it's necessary to actually strike that balance between how you bring yourself into the research as the researcher without imposing preconceptions or assumptions into that process. 
So specifically what we're going to be talking about today uh, is uh, the significance of positioning the researcher in grounded theory research and also the relationship between the position of the researcher and theoretical sensitivity. A lot of people actually struggle with the concept of theoretical sensitivity in grounded theory and so we're going to try and demystify that a little bit and talk about some strategies and techniques that the researcher can use to raise their theoretical sensitivity. Got to start off, of course, with some shameless self-promotion. And Mona did mention the work that Jane and I have done for, I think it's probably more than 10 years, Jane, now that we've been together working. Probably um, is. <laughs> it seems that long. It seems like a <laughs> match. <laughs> but um, uh, the, uh, the first textbook um, in, in research, uh, we actually did write an undergraduate textbook in research some years ago, but um, uh, the first major piece of work that we did together was the Grounded Theory textbook, um, which is now in its second edition and also its sister text, uh, Qualitative Methodology, a Practical Guide. So um, they're very inexpensive to purchase, so uh, we encourage you to do that because we do, what we aim to do with our work is to, as I say, demystify um, some of the often complex concepts around research, particularly in qualitative research and ground theory specifically. Um, okay, so let's start off with exploring some preliminary concepts and many of you will probably be grounded theorists undertaking grounded theory research and some of you may not be. And, um, and so just to, to set the baseline for that, grounded theory is an approach to research where the intent is to generate theory that is grounded in raw data. So it's induced from the data. And it's different to other forms or most other forms of qualitative research because the intent is to produce a theory that actually has explanatory power. So it goes beyond describing a phenomenon but actually aims to explain what is going on in a particular situation. And generally it's used to investigate topics about which there is little known. Uh, philosophy, in its very simplest term, is a worldview. Um, it refers to the values that make up someone's worldview, and it comprises the concepts of ontology and epistemology. Ontology is uh, the study of being, the nature of being, of existing, and the nature of reality. Epistemology, on the other hand, is the, the study of knowledge and what can be known, and important for us as researchers, how knowledge can be acquired. I'm going to hand over to Jane now, who's going to talk a little bit about um, philosophy and its relationship to research. I, I meant to say when I started out that one of the reasons that Jane and I work so well together is that we're quite yin and yang, and I tend to be a little bit more black and white, and Jane tends to be a little bit more abstract. So I'm going to hand over to her now to talk about those more abstract philosophical concepts. Thanks, Mel. Um, Thanks everybody so much for coming along today. Uh, I know for most of you it's yesterday afternoon over there in the Northern Hemisphere, but um, yeah, down south we're uh, early morning and um, really happy to be able to connect with people around the world in this way. So thanks very much for the opportunity. So um, I suppose Wells asked me to talk today about philosophy and research and I think one of the things that I really struggled with when I started my PhD was just really trying to wrap my head around you know, where it was that I was positioned and, and how it worked um, well, more generally and then how it actually worked for me. And um, there were lots of different things that I read. In fact, I had a pretty legendary uh, advisor when I was doing my PhD, a grounded theorist called Anne Bonner. And Anne actually, much to Melanie's horror, made me go away and read all of the grounded theory texts from woe to go. And um, as a result, I also discovered some of Marilyn and Nell's work. And for those of you who are grounded theorists, you've probably also read some of Marilyn's uh, work. Melanie and I were both fortunate enough to have Marilyn and Nell's examine our theses. And she was really one of the early people to talk about uh, the need, I think, to position yourself. So the need to really think through, uh, you know, what philosophical position were you taking in your research design? Because, in fact, that, you know, that philosophical position, as Mel will talk about later, really shapes uh, what it is that you actually do in the field. Uh, and, of course, back at your desk when you're analysing your data. So the slide you've got there in front of you at the moment really draws on the work of um, Goober and Lincoln and again for all my students I get them to read this particular chapter in the Handbook of Qualitative Research which talks about uh, paradigmatic controversies and developments and uh, I have to say the latest chapter of that uh, 
in the pink in the pink handbook, as we call it, that's the dark pink handbook, not the pale pink first edition handbook, um, is has even got a lot simpler and a lot easier to understand. And those authors really go through these sorts of concepts of positivism, post-positivism, post-modernism, and constructivism in some depth, and really provide, I think, uh, lots of cues for people who are quite new to philosophy to use in their thinking about how you actually understand what all of these different philosophical positions mean. So you can see up there that really, uh, on the slide, that really what we're talking about in relation to philosophy is this whole question about reality and what it is that we perceive to be uh, real. Mel, are you in charge of this PowerPoint? You must be, I think, are you not? I am, sorry. I'm, it just, I'm no? so in through all what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> As in, she's not oh, off everybody. She's no, losing no, her in the corner. No, <laughs> no snoring. <laughs> not like that, Dave. Okay, so um, what we really challenge you to do uh, as grounded theorists early in the piece, and, and I speak at the moment, I don't know, it's sort of funny, writing the, the books, I mean the grounded theory books were really written because at the time when we wrote the first book, we were new, new advisors ourselves and so we were trying to, I suppose, find a way to communicate to our own PhD candidates about some of the sort of basic elements of grounded theory that they really needed to get a grasp on before they can go forth and actually really explore in much more depth some of the work, of course, that's come before us that, that um, you know, we ourselves draw upon in our own work, our own research. And um, chapter one of the textbook really, uh, you know, gives you, I suppose, some good guidance around where to go to read more and uh, Mel likes to um, refer to our book as sometimes the dummy's guide we call it, don't we Mel, but I mean I think it's an introductory foundational text that you can start with uh, and we actually we send you off to go and look at all of the other authors uh, that have written such as so of course Strauss and Corbin and uh, Glazer and also Shamaz and, uh, and Adele Corbin's, uh, sorry, Adele Clark's work, of which I'm particularly uh, fond. And Mel and I are really quite different, and you probably, if you get to know us a little bit, will be able to spot which chapters we write. But chapter one's mine, and um, <clears throat> although I must say in the sister text, Qualitative Methodologies, I challenge Melanie to go and write the philosophical uh, chapter. And um, what is it you call that one, Mel? Practical philosophy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah practical right. philosophy is the non-philosopher, really. <laughs> That's the black and white girl coming out, but that's all right. That's pretty handy for some people. Um, so really, we challenge you to think about your philosophical position and what it is that counts to be real and true and what it is uh, that you think is going on in the world around you, and in particular about this idea of whether or not there is a single truth that can be uncovered or whether, in fact, there are multiple truths that we all need to understand in different ways and accept. So what's the big deal about all of this? You know, why is that important? Why does it matter? Well, it really matters uh, because there really has to be congruence between your own philosophical position, the research question that you've posed, the chosen methodology that you've, cho you've used, and also the grounded theory methods that you employ. And, um, you know, the, really the methodology that you choose, so whether or not you decide that you're going to position yourself in a constructivist paradigm, whether you're going to actually say, well, really my work more closely aligns with um, a postmodernist view of symbolic interactionism and Clark, or whether I'm much more comfortable in, uh, you know, the work with the work of Barney Glazer, which I would argue is uh, quite strongly post-positivist. That really then influences the way that you go out and actually um, undertake your research. So making decisions around who you recruit, how you recruit, uh, where it is that you know you're going to go next uh, in relation to theoretical sampling. So the slide you've got up on the screen at the moment, I suppose, really sums this up in a rather simple way, but I, a very nice illustrative way. And I thank Mel for designing this slide. Uh, because really it's this idea that research is a continuum and you can see there on the left hand side of that slide that you've really got the, the, the sort of left view really in many ways of research which really heads off there towards positivism and the idea that there is a single reality that can be perceived. And of course many of our colleagues here at JCU who work in research, work in labs where they are in fact trying to seek out some sort of um, 
single truth uh, about particular medicines or treatments or diagnoses and, um, and that is all well and good and proper as it ought to be. However, there are many of us also that sit on the right hand side of this continuum and that is where we're much more comfortable with the idea of multiple truths in the world and different ways of being able to interpret um, those individuals' realities and the ways that they interact together in order to create for them uh, what is their existence or their experience in um, our particular case of managing a, a process or, or actually using a process in their everyday life. So I think at this point I hand back over to Miss Melanie. Okay. Yes, actually, you were Professor Melody. Oh, I have this one as well. Yeah, you can have this. Okay. All right. This is your fabulous uh, activity from the text, where we actually encourage the reader to um, start to think about how they actually define reality and how they see the world and how knowledge can be gained of the world. From my own experience, um, as I said, I'm quite a black and white person, um, and and that you know that's a consequence of my own history and my educational experiences and my family experiences and, and how I've been brought up to see the world. But in my chosen profession of nursing, uh, as a social science, it's uh, difficult to gather information, to gather evidence and knowledge about the, the social world using black and white techniques. And so for that reason, um, I have moved into the qualitative sphere and I find that I've become very comfortable there. So I guess my point is that your philosophical position is not necessarily set and as we'll talk about in a moment, um, the theoretical sensitivity that you bring to a particular research situation is therefore not necessarily set in concrete and there are ways of, of adapting to, um, to a given study area to bring out your person your personal philosophy and supplement that with your um, knowledge of the world and the knowledge that you gain throughout your study. But in respect of uh, getting into position, we actually do encourage you from the outset to, to look at the assumptions you have about the world, to um, look at where those assumptions have come from. Uh, this is really important, particularly in grounded theory research, so that you don't impose preconceptions that you bring from your own history into your research situation. just want to talk for a couple of minutes about um, philosophical positioning and the role of philosophy in grounded theory generally. And those of you that are familiar with grounded theory texts will know that there wasn't a lot of attention paid in the seminal works, for example, the discovery of grounded theory texts from 1967. It's not discussed at, uh, at any length, really. Um, it, there's probably an abstract theme that you could abstract thread that you can pick up, but it's really not easily identifiable. But in 87, Strauss actually talked about the role of researchers' biographies in a research situation. It was in 2008 that Strauss and Corbin acknowledged the position of the researcher in the co-construction of the research product. And um, those of you that have seen Jane's very well cited work on uh, discerning a constructivist thread in the work of Strauss and Corbin will have an understanding of uh, what that looks like. In 2005, Clark said, we need to become more visible and accountable for in and through our research. So there we're starting to see even more reference to the role that the researcher has in uh, a research study, uh, particularly grounded theory. Uh, and Charmaz is probably the one that, and Charmaz is a very popular author in grounded theory because I think she actually brings us back to the reality that the researcher is an instrument in, um, in a research study, is a subjective instrument of data collection. And, and to be effective in that in grounded theory, you need to recognise the influence that these taken for granted assumptions have on our research. So the ideas that we have, the, the history that we bring, the experience that we bring, the educational knowledge or the educational products from our own experiences that we bring to a situation will impact on a research study. And the way that they um, actually influence a research study are in respect of the relationship that um, the researcher has with the data. So where you position yourself will absolutely determine that relationship. And positioning also influences the researcher's theoretical sensitivity. And as we've discussed, is, uh, theoretical sensitivity is a very important element of ground theory research. This diagram actually 
represents the relationship that a researcher has with the data, depending on where they position themselves. So if you consider yourself an objective instrument of data collection from participants, so your role is to extract data from participants, uh, you are going to be in a much more objective position uh, and your relationship will be very different in terms of where you stand in respect of that data, but also the product of that data collection exercise. And we talk about, Jane and I talk about this being collection of data, as opposed to the generation of data which occurs when the researcher actually positions themselves as an active participant in data generation activity. So in order to ensure that your study design is methodologically congruent, you need to be very, very conscious of your philosophical position. Because as Jane mentioned earlier, it, it's not only about how you see the process, but it's about how you enact the process. Whether or not you're going to be an objective researcher who undertakes an interview using a highly structured interview guide, or a, um, a more constructivist researcher who starts off with one broad question and then follows the leads in the data and works with the participant to construct um, the product of that interview. Uh, is going to depend very much on your philosophical position. Mel, can I just make a comment there as well? I think that um, it's also important to think about data analysis as well because even when you yourself are sitting back in your office and you've got a transcript and you're interacting really with that transcript, the way that you code that is also influenced by the position that you take. So the sorts of things that you're looking for in the data are very much influenced about whether or not, say, if you took a symbolic interactionist approach to your work as compared to a post-positivist, the sorts of um, codes that you would see in the data will be influenced by the way that you think about the data. So it's important to understand that that works not just about the between the relationship between you and the participant, but really you and the data as well in that whole process of concurrent data collection and analysis or data generation and analysis depending on how it is that you see yourself. You make a really good point, Jane, because that has um, implications for the type of data that you use because while we tend to use interview primarily, a lot of grounded theorists tend to think that of interview as the only form of, of data. The truth is that um, we are using and we're encouraging our students more and more to look to more static forms of data such as um, documents that already exist or you know, um, blogs off the internet, uh, um, data that is extant rather than elicited, um, as Shamas would say. And so, well, um, yeah, sorry, go there's, Sorry, there's also that whole, I mean, a lot of the work we've been doing around getting students out into the field to do some observation for a start as well. So in the qualitative methodology book, um, we explore those ideas in much more depth and I would really um, encourage people who are interested in our grounded theory work to also grab a copy of the qualitative methodology book because we look at different aspects of qualitative research in that book which feed into our views on grounded theory in a very complementary way. But um, in particular this idea that, as Mel just alluded to there, that grounded theorists tend to treat the interview as being the gold standard of data generation with participants, whereas in actual fact Silverman um, creates a very uh, interesting argument which I've certainly followed through in the literature in that other text around the idea that we we really need to think beyond recount data when it comes to grounded theory studies and as a consequence Mel and I have both currently got students doing some pretty amazing things. I'll let Mel tell a story in a moment about uh, one of our students that's doing some survey work to start off with but we certainly are using ethnographic observation more and more and uh, we're also using uh, retrospective data sets as well so there's a lot of um, I suppose new thinking in the work that we're doing with our students and if you're interested in tracking some of this then you're probably best to go and have a look at our journal article publication list because our students tend to submit theses by publications and we do encourage them to publish around some of these methodological innovations. Mel, I'll hand back to you. Thanks Jane. Yes, and I've recently had a student complete who's written a paper on this very topic of positioning yourself uh, to appropriately, or to effectively, I should say, analyse documents. So how do you have the same relationship with that static data that you can have with a participant who can engage in interaction? And you have mentioned another one of our students who, uh, I have to be careful what I say because she's probably um, joined us this morning, 
And so yeah, she's our absolute favourite student in the whole she's world. She's a star performer. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so Alona is actually, um, she's starting off with a survey, but while the survey data will gather information such as you know, demographic, usual demographic stuff, age, gender, educational qualifications, which will allow some comparisons for some background work. What is an, it's enabling her to do is to very much develop theoretical sensitivity as it happens and she's actually started writing a paper on this very concept of using survey data to develop theoretical sensitivity as a, as a novice researcher. So um, there are many, many ways of doing it and Jane, you could, uh, we won't um, digress too much but people might be interested in some of the work that one of your students has done in using digital stories for example. So there's, there's some really exciting stuff and we really do encourage you to move beyond this idea that you know there is only one way of getting quality data for grounded community and that is interview because while interview is important and focus groups as, you, as your standard approaches, um, think outside the square. And in our book we do talk about other people's work where they have actually conducted entire grounded theory studies without doing a single interview. So, so do think outside the square. Anyway, um, we've, I've mentioned theoretical sensitivity a couple of times. So, so what is it? Well, it's theoretical sensitivity is an instrument in the development of grounded theory. If you don't embrace theoretical sensitivity, some people think that they can get away with not, not considering the concept or developing the concept, uh, then you won't um, produce a rich um, grounded theory. It'll be a very shallow in product. We define theoretical sensitivity as the ability to recognise and extract from the data elements that have relevance for your emerging theory. And the example that I sometimes use is, you know, if you imagine that you had three jigsaw puzzles of famous landmarks, you know, for example, the Eiffel Tower, Sydney Harbour Bridge or the Statue of Liberty, and you tip all of the pieces of these three puzzles into a barrel and, sh and shuffle them up. If you were then to extract one piece of puzzle, you would have some idea where that puzzle piece fits. You might know from the colour of it that it's a piece of sky or a piece of grass or a piece of water. You might not know which puzzle it comes from, but you know that it's sky or it's grass or it's water. Or you might know that it's part of the Eiffel Tower, but you don't know which part of the Eiffel Tower, but you know it belongs to that particular puzzle. This is what theoretical sensitivity is. It's not necessarily knowing where a piece of data fits exactly, but it's knowing that that piece of data has relevance to your developing theory. So some characteristics of theoretical sensitivity. I've alluded to this before, that it reflects the sum of your personal, professional and experiential history. It can be enhanced by various techniques and tools and strategies, which I'll talk about in a moment. And something that you will be aware of is that your theoretical sensitivity increases as your research progresses. So Jane and I often have students who they look completely lost and they don't know what they're doing. Um, or they think they don't know what they're doing. But you know, you see over the course of a number of months that this their confidence develops. And the reason their confidence develops is because they're developing this theoretical sensitivity. And, and we use open coding initially in grounded theory and that's because you really don't know what you're looking for, whereas you become much more focused as your study progresses. What are some of the ways that we can raise our theoretical sensitivity? It's really important that you consider before you begin what you already know. So identify what those assumptions are that you have about the world. One of Jane's students, Karen Hoare, has um, produced an interesting paper about dancing with the data. And it, this is a reflection of the fact that the process of grounded theory research is not linear. And so when you're working with data, you are stepping forward and you are sticking back and you are sidestepping through that data as you construct this theory that it will be your final grounded theory. Strauss and Corbin have a number of what they call analytical tools. A lot of people find comfort in using these tools because they give the process structure and if you're a black and white person like myself, you might actually find that that works for you. Um, Shamas talks about the need to tolerate ambiguity and I often think about how important that is because the process is not 
never cut and dried, and so you need to be able to tolerate ambiguity. And so if you really do struggle, the more you struggle with tolerating the ambiguity of the process and the findings as you progress through your analysis, the more comfort you may find in using analytical tools such as the one that Strauss and Corbin suggest. And I'm talking about things like the flip-flop technique and raising the red flag. They're not ones that, that I've used. I think Jane may have dabbled in them, but um, it, it, again, it depends on where you position yourself as to whether or not you find that these products are useful to you. Just a handy um, hint, sorry Mel, handy hint for those who are interested in that, the only book really worth reading is 1987, so don't worry too much about the later editions of that text. If you want to find out about analytical tools, just go straight to the original. Thank you. Useful information. We're nothing if not practical. All the tips. <laughs> um, examine your, don't bother looking up berksandmills.com, it doesn't exist, although Jane, maybe we should. Do <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Find us on Facebook. Um, uh, and uh, further to actually identifying your baseline of knowledge and uh, your baseline of um, your assumptions is to continually examine your underlying assumptions about the world on an ongoing basis. And the absolute best way to do that is to memo, memo, memo. Memoing is the cornerstone of ground theory. If you are not memoing, if you are not writing memos, if you're not producing, um, memos as an analytical tool in support of your processes, then you are not doing ground theory. It, I, I actually don't know of anyone who's produced a quality ground theory who hasn't actually had their head embedded in memos from the outset. Uh, and it should be from the outset, from, the, from before you even begin um, thinking about your study. This is where you start thinking about your research and it's where you, I was memoing well after my um, research was complete. You know, it's as a type of debriefing strategy, strategy, I suppose. And you know, we've written about it in the book, and um, we also have a paper out about um, the process of memoing. Uh, can I just make a comment there? Because that's Melanie's good stuff. Melanie's the queen of memoing. She's written some wonderful papers on it. But the other thing you can do is go onto YouTube and and search for Melanie, and you'll find there's a very nice YouTube. <laughs> interview that Mel did uh, for me on memoing, which I was very grateful for. I was giving a lecture and, and Mel was working at a different university at that time and so recorded something for me to insert into a PowerPoint. And that thing has gone, well, viral for Grounded Theory Land. There's been a lot of people viewed it. So if you're interested in finding out more, go and listen to Melanie talking about memoing. Yes, yeah, so I need to invest some time in digitally Botoxing that. <laughs> <laughs> A bit of uh, photoshopping of that would be. You look very life. glamorous. Don't worry uh, about it. Oh, I see. This is why we get on so well. You lie to me. Um, okay, so that actually brings us to um, to the end of the presentation. And uh, there are some references there, and some of them that Jane has mentioned, and as Jane has suggested. Um, if you have a look, you can find us on Research Going Google Scholar and all the usual places, and you'll find lists of our publications and um, I think well, we hope that you find them very valuable and of course please don't hesitate to email us at any time if you have a question or you've got a you know we, we often get emails from students around the globe saying um, you know love your book don't understand this or um, you know how do you see this and what do you think about this particular perspective and and we're more than happy to share our experiences because we've been through the pain of it so we're happy to help others who are in that process at the moment and so um, I'm going to hand over now back to Ricardo to uh, manage the questions. Thank, yes. you. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie and Jane. Uh, everybody, uh, please feel free to ask your questions. Um, you can either click on the hand icon next to your name on the control panel, on the go to webinar control panel. Uh, that will tell me that you would like to speak. And you can also uh, write down your questions uh, using the questions pane in the control panel. Uh, so, everybody, we are uh, uh, just go ahead and, and ask your questions if you have any. We've dumbfounded them all, Melanie. Come yeah. on, people, there must be one question. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we can get up at um, some ungodly hour on a Friday morning and uh, <laughs> put on an extra layer of makeup, um, mm. don't be shy. Don't be shy. We need, um, <laughs> no, uh, the, the, the audience is, is very uh, shy today, uh, so we don't have any questions yet. Let's see. 
anybody? Usually it just takes one person to uh, start. start the process. That's right. And then we have a flood of them. Yes, that is what usually happens. So let's 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 uh, give people a few minutes to think about what they would like to ask. Would you like to you add anything shy. else, Jane and Melanie, while people think about their questions? In fact, I got the first one, and this oh. this will start. Uh, Karen, I will give you the microphone, Karen, so that you can ask the question on your own. So let me uh, unmute your microphone now. Karen, can you speak? Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes we can indeed. Okay. Um, thanks, Mel and Jane. I'm sitting here in my lounge room in Palm Cove, just up the road from you. Um, <laughs> in your jammies. And I've got my lip here. Yeah, I have actually. I'm sitting here in my pajamas, uh, <laughs> having my breakfast. So thanks for the class. Um, I just thought I'd just start by asking about memos. Um, I've just had my confirmation seminar, so I'm very, very new to this PhD game, and I've never been one to keep a diary. When I was when I was growing up as a teenager or anything like that, so how do you actually get started doing the memos? I mean, I've made lots of little notes and you know sat down and thought about what I'm going to do with focus groups and organising and interviews. I mean, is that the type of thing that would be considered a memo, or does it have to be more profound? I'm, I'm sure you're going to hand this one to me, Jane. I'm not even saying a word. I'm just waiting for you to respond. <laughs> Karen, first of all, congratulations on your confirmation, which I'm assuming was successful. So that, that's an excellent, excellent milestone. Um, not meaning to flog the book, but you can get it from the library. But if you have a look at um, the Appendix A, it talks about my journey in, in the same, exactly the same situation you described as being a novice and you know finding finding my feet. But I, I'm exactly the same. I felt really uncomfortable. What I started to do was to keep a journal in the first instance because I thought I'm going to write a paper on the experience of doing a PhD. I thought someone will publish this, so I'll keep a journal. <laughs> and um, and so I and because I'm no good at it, I, I'd start off by saying met with supervisors today. It was good <laughs> doing doing uh, literature search tomorrow, and it was really stilted like that. But as time went on, it started to become reflective, and I'd, I'd write things like, "Just had meeting with my supervisors. Oh, they're so frustrating. They tell me one thing, and then they tell me another thing." And I should point out, I had absolutely brilliant supervisors, but at that stage, I obviously didn't know what I was doing. Um, so it actually, and what happened was, I it kind of evolved, and I I started to then I tried to write memos, which were very stilted, the same. It was it was difficult to put stuff on paper, but over time. I, you know, they became extremely long and and passionate, and they'd have diagrams and and um, I think it's Shamas who says it doesn't matter how you do it as long as you do it. And so whatever's working for you at the moment, keep doing it. And and I actually, as I, I'm, I was going to say, not a traditionalist in terms of memos, but I don't even know what a traditionalist might look like. Um, but even though I, I've written a bit around the area and I do talk about you know the ways that I did it and I did um, construct different types of memos because it's it suited the way my head worked so I would have operational memos and I would have analytical memos and I would have coding memos and Strauss and Corbin have you know different categories again and, and Glazer says don't categorize them because it doesn't fit with his philosophical position and that's absolutely fine so find a way that works for you and stick with it if it's it might be um, that you do them electronically, you might handwrite them, you might drop them straight into in vivo. Um, but I think just the, the important things are, uh, and these are standard rules, run them open, as Glaze calls it. So that means that you never shut a memo. You, you, if you look at some of mine, I'm happy to send you some examples, there'll be um, dates and a, and a heading and then it would be two pages and then there'll be another date thrown in and I'll have like additional comments and I'll you know, wax lyrical for another couple of pages, and, but that's because it's a never-ending process. Um, you have to label them well because you will go back in to try and find them. You, the, the whole purpose of memoing is, if I can give you an example, um, I had a, I was fortunate enough to have a scholarship when I did my PhD. So I used to I work better before lunch. So I find that I have to have lunch very late so I can get a lot of work done. 
because once I have lunch, I'm <laughs> slow. And I used to have lunch with Oprah every day at two o'clock. And I would, um, uh, so I'd work really hard, and then I'd I'd, uh, I'd be hungry at two o'clock, and I'd go and sit down and have lunch with Oprah. When I went back downstairs at three o'clock, um, I would look at a decision I'd made, um, an analytical decision, and I couldn't remember why I'd done that, and it didn't make any logical sense to me. And so I'd have to start the whole process again, and I'd end up in the same spot. Once I got into memoing. I, I would record those decisions and it saves so much time because you're not second guessing yourself, you're not replicating processes because I could just read and say, oh and now I remember why I did that because when I looked, when I did the constant comparison of this piece of data with that bit of data I actually realised that what I was looking at was this phenomenon. So I hope that makes sense to you and I've actually gone off on a bit of a tangent but um, I'm more than happy if you want to click me an email if you want to um, discuss that further. The other uh, that's thing great. Was Yep, go. It's sort of what I've been doing, but it, like you said, it didn't. It doesn't feel natural. It's not something that comes naturally to me. So, and I'm, I know another person that we know uh, writes poetry and is is very sort of deep thinking, and that's on paper, sort of putting things down on paper. But that's not me. So I've struggled with it a little bit up to this, this stage, but um, that's good. Dot points might work for you. I started off doing dot points in May. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'll you just, don't, I'll you know, play around with it. It is, yeah. think of it, the other way to think of it also is about developing an audit trail about decision making just like Mel said because, you know, yeah, we, yeah. you know, there's some lovely work on audit trails that you really need to have a look at but uh, the way to manage them, <clears throat> I'm the practical girl today, the way to manage them well <laughs> um, my students find is using Evernote. So, uh, so you use Evernote to write memos so that's, it basically turns into what Clark um, refers to very lovingly, which I really like, is intellectual capital in the bank. It's a great quote, that one. But you can um, tag notes in Evernote, uh, which means that you can sort and, you know, you can put a tag on there that might say, um, I don't know, constant comparison or, you know, even a transcript uh, marker so you know where you were, you were in relation to analysing a particular transcript when you wrote that memo. So Evernote is the go. It is the way to organise okay. memos. Okay, thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much, Karen and uh, and uh, and uh, Jane and Melanie. Uh, anybody else would like to ask questions? I'm sure that that our presenters today are would be more than happy to <laughs> answer any questions you may have. Yes, we don't bite. <laughs> yes, <Not this> <laughs> You don't buy it, at least not so from so far away. <laughs> no, that's right. You're quite safe, Ricardo, wherever yeah. you might be in Canada. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Well, our audience is a little shy uh, again. Uh, I would say that. Uh, let me see. Nobody here. Uh, would you? We still have a few minutes left. Would you like to to add a few more things, uh, Jane and Melanie? I'd just like to say that um, we're actually planning on going to next year's uh, qualitative research conference in Glasgow. I think Mona will be able to tell us where it is. I'm pretty sure it's in Glasgow in Scotland, isn't it, Mona? She's not, she might be on mute. Yes, uh, no, sorry, I'm here. <laughs> I'm hey. that mute button. Um, <laughs> yes, it is, in, it is in Glasgow, yes, next year. Um, let me just double check. I'm just covering for a vet, so let me just double check the um, the dates of that. So Mel and I have been invited to run a workshop uh, in Glasgow by a vet, so we'll be in Glasgow next year, so if you'd like to come and join us face to face for a day, that's where we'll be. If you're not a bit closer to us in the meantime, of course. Thank you. Yes, yeah, it's in May, <laughs> May 2016. Great. Okay, okay. Now, um, um, Let's see, if you have uh, a few more things to say, uh, Jane and Melanie, please go ahead. Otherwise, perhaps we can ask uh, Mona uh, to say a few words about the, the different uh, events that are coming up on, on IIQM. Uh, Melanie and, 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 and Jane, would you like to add anything else? People Not for are me, right. Ricardo, I'm good. I guess um, the only thing to say is that, you know, it's. Um, it, the, it, there are a lot of concept, complex concepts in grounded theory and as I've said a couple of times our aim is to make them a little bit more understandable and um, 
but don't be put off if you find that you struggle with things like uh, you know theoretical sensitivity is the big one. Theoretical sampling is something that um, people interpret in different ways as well. Um, but it's certainly worth the time investing in you know, reading, as Jane has suggested, our text is a good starting point. There are some really good um, uh, books that are available. There's a lot of articles that you can obtain through a simple search of Google Scholar uh, that will help you to understand the finer points of um, of the more complex elements of grounded theory. So if you are a, a budding grounded theorist, um, please don't be put off. There are um, obviously uh, some complexities inherent, but that can be said of any approach to research, particularly qualitative methodologies. And, and don't consider yourself to be uh, a person who's not suited to qualitative research because I initially thought that that was the case for me, but um, and he, but here we are today. So I'll, uh, I'll hand back now to Ricardo and, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you very yes, much. Thanks everybody, it was great. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, now let me, let me ask Mona to say a few uh, words about the different IIQM events. Mona? Excellent. Thank you. And thank you very much to uh, Melanie and Jane for presenting today. It was an e excellent presentation. Um, so yes, IIQM, we've got another um, webinar coming up on November 5th. Um, and jo John Olive will be speaking on doing gender and health research. Um, and then in addition to the Glasgow conference that, uh, that was mentioned, that's in May, um, there's also TQDU, which is in Australia, uh, in February of 2016. So thank you very much to everyone who participated today. Thank you, Mona. Now, the, uh, the PowerPoint, as well as the recording of this presentation, uh, will be available on the IIQM website. Um, so, uh, I don't know if you already have the PowerPoint, uh, uh, Mona? No, I, I, must send, I will send that to you, Mona. I'll send that to you this morning. Okay, okay so everybody, you can go to the IIQM uh, website and, and see that. Uh, locations. In fact, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make an effort to show that to you, everybody. Just a second, uh, just a second, so that you can have that. Let me see here. Well, now it looks like you're going to see my screen, my computer screen, and here you go to uh, webinars, and you see here the uh, all of the uh, presentations from 2013 up to now. Uh, and if you click there, you will see uh, the PowerPoints and video, and video recordings, with the exception of the last two. Um, one of them will not be there, the, uh, Jane, uh, Jane's presentation, because at the end of the webinar, I was recording and the, and the computer crashed and I lost that, that video. Uh, but we should have, I think, Maria Mayan's presentation. So here you can see the calendar of activities and we are preparing the calendar for 2016. And we hope that you join us. Your, your uh, participation is essential for the su success of this activity. Thank you, all of you. Goodbye. Thanks, Ricardo. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.